Hey guys, how's it going? Michael Troy here. I am so excited. Today we are talking to comic book legend Craig Hamilton, someone I am so happy and proud to be able to call my friend. Um, he uh, definitely is known for his blue, revolutionary blue Aquaman costume and some beautiful work on some amazing titles such as Fables, Marvel Fanfare, um, Starman, I believe, but we can get all into all that um, in a few minutes here. Uh, longtime comic veteran and truly beautiful classic fine artist, Craig Hamilton. So thank you so much for being here today, Craig. How are you? I'm great, and it's a thrill to be here with you. Oh, I'm so excited. So you were so young when you broke into the comic book industry, weren't you? Like, I mean, still a teenager, right? Nine, well, on, on the cusp of 20. Yeah, I mean, close enough. I mean, that's pretty young to get into the industry. So um, what, how, like, uh, are you a lifelong comic book fan? Like, were you reading kid comics as a kid? What was your introduction to comics? Oh. Definitely. Uh, loved comics, loved visual storytelling. Um, and of course, it started with superheroes. Um, but I think by the time I was 16, I discovered Heavy Metal magazine and European comics, um, uh, American underground comics. And I really loved those, you know, things that did not have superheroes in them. Yeah, I feel like everyone's first introduction to comic books is superhero comic books, though. Um, when were you like first started noticing artists? Were you following artists, or did you have favorites? Oh, gosh, you... yeah. You know, I must have been 12 or 13 when, you know, certain art styles were sticking with me. You know, um, the uh, Neil Adams, Michael Netzer, uh, Mike Grell. I think, you know, those were some early on. And then I discovered the studio, Barry Smith, uh, Michael Kaluta, Jeffrey Jones, Bernie Wrightson. And that really notched it up for me because not only were they doing comics, they were also fine artists. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because um, when I think of you, I largely think of uh, you being responsible or I thank you in my mind for bringing fine art to comic books. Um, and you, I put you in the same category as some of the artists you mentioned, like Barry Windsor Smith and Mike Paluta. I feel like uh, oh, that's an honor. P, uh, P. Craig Russell, who's more like a contemporary of yours, um, is definitely oh, in yeah. that category too. Um, Cause you have this really beautiful style that sort of reminds me of, you know, like, Greek Greek gods and like beautiful statues and um when I'm describing um you know like when I'm doing reviews and stuff and I'm uh, covering someone who has an art style that uh is like similar to yours or Peacock Craig Russell I always describe it as a romantic style and I realize uh from an art point of view that's probably not the correct term completely but that's what I feel when I look at art like yours no, I'll take the compliment yeah, okay, the um, I think um, from from what I know of you, um, I guess uh, you've had a mentor who was like uh, who in, that you worked with for seven years that like really encouraged you to like learn how to draw from life and um, like exactly. not comics. And I think that probably really informed your style. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, of course, you know, I was into comics early 11, 12 years old. And when I was 13, I started private classes with Hauser Smith, a great portrait artist, uh, designer, and teacher. And uh, when I started with him, he had never had a student that young. Mm -hmm. And But I had one of his students was going into art education, and she did a summer art camp. And uh, I got in, enrolled in that. And after the art camp was over, Hauser called my mom and said, you know, Craig has a lot of talent. And would he be interested in studying with me? So she signed me up and, you know, I was just in hog heaven. It was like going to Hogwarts. Yeah, that must have been like such a great, uh, unique experience, you know, um, 
I mean, for young artists to, like, I think that is like such a, like a, a young artist to be able to work with, uh, you know, a seasoned or a trained artist. Like if anybody ever has that opportunity, you should definitely take that chance, you know? Oh, so yeah. And um, just uh, focused on the fundamentals of drawing right out the gate. And uh, I had a passion for it and, uh, you know, and I loved it. Uh, and Hauser knew that I eventually wanted to go into comics and uh, he did not exactly approve of it. I was going to say, I, I can imagine. Especially after I'd been with him for a couple of years, you know, I was getting more and more serious about that. And um, yeah, you, you're a good artist. That's a little beneath you and all of that kind of old school stuff. And he said, I can't teach you how to draw comics, but I can teach you how to draw. Yeah. And, That's interesting. You know, so I, and Hauser was a graduate um, of the Art Students League out of New York. Um, he attended college here in Macon at Wesleyan University, which is primarily a women's college. Mm -hmm. But in the 20s, they were uh, part of the Art Students League and they were granting degrees in art to men. And he was the first man to graduate from Wesleyan Ladies College. Well, how do? <laughs> and uh, like me, he was a native son of Macon, Georgia. So I grew up hearing stories from his life and the history of the, our city. And um, I heard, I stayed with him pretty much, I can say, for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, of course, I finished up high school and went off to a uh, college. I went to the Atlantic College of Art for a year. I did not want to go. I wanted to go to New York and start my career. But um, between him and my mother and my teachers at uh, high school, they insisted that I go. And I said, well, I'm going to an art college. I'm not going to go to a college with an art department. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I did, I did fine that first year, but it was not where I was supposed to be. And I had cultivated uh, a lot of contacts in the business and of uh, comics through retailers. And there was back then, you know, it wasn't a monopoly in the distribution system. So you had regional distributors all over the place. And the main one in the Southeast was Glenwood Distributing. So I got a job with them where all I had to do was help load up the van go to a show, unload the van, set up the table, and then I was free to take my portfolio around and make those, you know, contacts. I was, And it was the 80s. It was an incredible time. I was meeting all of my heroes, you know, and putting names, uh, faces with the names in their work. And it was just a thrill. And I was really blessed in that time that, you know, the editors were – men that I genuinely admired through their work. Um, you know, uh, my first editor was Dick Giordano. Wow. And, How cool is know, that? Yeah. And, you know, all of these great artists uh, who tucked me under their wing, um, primarily Michael Paluta. Mm -hmm. um, boy, that was just like getting a fairy godfather. Wow, right there. That is amazing. Yes, it really I mean, is. And um, so many of the men like that, you know, uh, the co the colors on the Aquaman series were done by Joe Orlando. Wow, that is just and, you I, know, and I got they got Craig Russell to ink me on the covers, and yeah, I know that's how I finally that's how I first met him, and that led to a lifelong friendship. Wow. That is, and, you I know, know. And we, we've been really lucky that we've been able to collaborate more. You know, we did a, the, one of the Fables graphic novels together, and it was just one of the most joyful creative experiences I've ever had. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, um, when you get two artists of your caliber together, like uh, magic is definitely going to happen. Speaking of Aquaman, I know, um, you know, I had recently reviewed the uh, miniseries uh for my channel uh hoping to bring some attention to it we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second but you know the fact that it's never been collected 
and a trade paperback is just crazy to me and everyone else. Um, but also crazy. Um, yeah, like, so you're 19, 20 years old. This is your very first comic book work. And not only is it for DC Comics, but it's on arguably what seems to be like a super important mini series. It's probably Aquaman's like, um, I mean, I don't know if he had, he probably didn't have a title at the time, but it's to introduce this infamous blue camouflage uh, yeah, costume. Yeah, it's a big dramatic visual change for the character. So now you're, are you, this is, uh, is Neil Ponser uh, giving you the work on this? Is that how you came to Aquaman or how did that happen any at all? Uh, well, Neil had written the scripts for the four issue series and um, they were looking for an artist. So there was some com competition and uh, apparently Alan Davis was in the running. Um, and uh, I got called, I was in New York, uh, you know, I had uh, Klaus Jansen let me stay with him for a while. Uh, Rick Bryant had a studio in Manhattan and was always open door to artists coming in and working and staying if they need to. And so being in the city and being there and available was a huge, huge thing. And uh, it was actually through Klaus that I met Neil Posner mm -hmm. and, you know, showed him my work and got it on Dick Giordano's desk. And uh, I got the call to come into the office that Dick wanted to talk to me and he let me know that I got the job. Wow. It was exciting. It was like something out of a movie. Right. You know, I, I, it's funny listening to you talk because that really was such a great time. Like everybody says like the time that they, you know, their heyday was like the best of times, but that really was like an incomparable time, like New York in the eighties. I mean, Klaus Janssen, talk about another like legend. I mean, to be able to pick his brain or just like be in his studio, my God, like talk about an education in itself, you know? Oh um, yeah. I think, um, Actually, he was working for DC at the time. He was working on uh, Jim. Oh, yeah. I remember on that. On Saturn. Yeah. Another great miniseries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautiful artwork. Mm -hmm. So what... Uh, uh, I mean, so how do you feel about the legacy of the blue costume? I feel like some... Like, I love it. Like, I absolutely love it. I feel like some people kind of dismiss it. Like, I... I it kind of didn't last very long. I, you know? like, I, I see more love than ire. Oh, so. yeah, for sure. Like, it's definitely nostalgic. And, like, maybe the fact that it didn't take off help, like, makes people more affectionate, too, too, you know? Like, I was, I felt a little blindsided. Like, as a young reader, like, I, I absolutely fell in love with your art. It was the most beautiful art I've ever seen in a comic book. And then I was very excited about Aquaman's blue costume. You know, as a young little blonde boy, I always liked the blonde superheroes. So I always loved Aquaman. And then it just sort of never happened. Maybe it just didn't catch on or anything, <laughs> I guess. But so what, what, so this is your first big comic book gig. And that must have been kind of a daunting task. How were you, uh, uh, how were you, how, how was it? Like, were you able to keep up with the deadlines? Was it a difficult um, process? I'm, you know, admittedly slower than a lot of traditional artists, but I don't take a lot of shortcuts. Yeah. Well, and that's and, your first gig and that's quite a different thing drawing like that many sequential page, pages as opposed oh, yeah. to what you're, you know, that's a job. <laughs> but, you know, I always had a, uh, Joe Orlando and uh, you know those the, those caliber of artists to lean on, mm -hmm. you know, and they were incredibly supportive and helpful. You know, uh, Dick Giordano just gave me some. Just anytime I was stuck, he could help me get unstuck. And editors simply cannot do that anymore. <laughs> The, you know, the editor, those editors are just such a rare breed and like a, a great quality. Like 
you know, as a fan r- reading the letters pages and stuff, you could always got like a, a sense of like who the great editors were like, you know, Mark Grunwald um, um, comes to mind for sure. Um, another book that you worked on um, that I loved and um, is definitely like up there with Aquaman as far as uh, like what I'm sure people remember you for is your uh, Mohawk Storm story and Marvel fanfare. One of my favorites for sure. Um, Storm is like arguably one of the best comic book characters ever. So um, <clears throat> well, Carl we have Potts. Alan Milgram to thank for that. Oh yeah, Al Milgram, a great yeah. guy too. Like, talk about a legend. Yeah. Um, so he brought you to Marvel Fanfare. Yes, and um, Archie Goodwin actually had a hand in that. Um, I, uh, you know, it's just it, back then the rivalry, the two different camps between Marvel and DC was a strange thing to sort of be caught in the middle of. Um, but I had a couple of editors at Marvel who really liked my work, um, but it was not Marvel style at all. And I knew it. So I was just going to push that envelope as far as I could whenever I had an opportunity. And, uh, you know, Alan Milgram pretty much had Marvel fanfare as his own thing, and he called the shots. So um, I did a couple of portfolios and the the Storm story. Um, that was actually conceived with Chris Claremont. He had come to Atlanta for a convention. I believe it was Fantasy Fair. It may have been Dragon Con. I can't remember because we kind of had those two going in Atlanta at the same time. And uh, we had a grand time. You know, over the weekend, I took him to my favorite dance club, which kind of inspired that story. Interesting. Oh, my God. (laughs) So he scripted it, but I was still finishing up the Aquaman miniseries. So I kind of had to finish that obligation before I could do the Storm story. Yeah, good idea. Uh, You know, and I, I was like slowly working on the storm story while I was finishing up the last issue of Aquaman. So once I put, got that in the can, I was able to go in and finish it up. And that of course was inked by Rick Bryant. So, um, and then you said you did some portfolio work with it. Was there another short story perhaps you did for Marvel fanfare or am I? No? Just the one. Oh, okay. And, Just um, one so and then a portfolio and some so pinups here and there. Yeah, and, um, that was it for Marvel. And, uh, you know, my popularity was just not as strong at Marvel as it was as at DC. You know, I got yeah. along much better with the editors at DC. Um, you know, and back in, in that time period is when Kamiko Comics just got started rolling. And on the convention circuit, I met Shelley Bond. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shelly Roberg back then, but Shelly Bond now. And, you know, I just, she and I just clicked. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a lot in common. We instantly became friends. And um, that helped so much later on when she was at Vertigo and getting me work there. Which, you know, led to Fables. I, I mean, I owe everybody on that team, on the Fables team, gratitude for getting me in on fables and it was a great way to um i guess finish out my career at dc yeah Um, we kind of knew like uh vertigo was going strong when the book started in issue five there was a hitch where steve lealoha couldn't ink it and uh because he had some surgery or something going on and shelly asked him you know who you think could come in and do a fill-in and my name came up and she's like oh yeah you know he's doing great because i was uh i had been working doing uh every fifth issue of uh jam to mattis's uh specter uh-huh. and shading for ryan sook on that book and uh so she was seeing you know that i had work coming out on a steady basis you know i'm still not the fastest guy in the business but i'm good and there's a baseline there for how long it'll take me to do something and inking, you know, it was to come in and, uh, ink. 
And um, I loved the penciler, and we clicked. He loved what I was doing with his work. Um, and I liked it. It wasn't superheroes. It was more like working on a romance comic. Yeah, a for sure. A romance comic. Yeah. And, um, of course, the, the main book was set in modern day New York. Love that. Um, and then it came time to finally do a fable story that was the high fairy tale fantasy. And that, of course, was The Last Castle and a chance for Craig Russell and I to, because we had talked for years about working on something together. And we knew exactly how, like, Craig would do layouts. I would tighten up the pencils and then we'd go back to him for inking. We knew exactly how we wanted to do it. And um, and we were able to. It was just like that, that. That was really one of the most fulfilling experiences I've had working on a project. Well, that's good. And that's a good uh, way to round out your career at DC then, I guess. Um, you had mentioned the Spectre fill-in issues, which I, I remember the first uh, time you uh, came in on the Spectre, I was like very excited. I was like, oh, yes, I can't believe this. Like, because, you know, this is like pre-internet. So it's like back, you know, now we would know like several months in advance, but then it was just kind of a surprise. And I was like, yes. Um, but, you know, I guess speed is a factor. So it's like after Aquaman wraps and you do the Marvel fanfare story, then um, is this when the Spectre stuff is coming about? Oh, no, that was almost 10 years later. Oh, okay. Maybe so what? More. What are you? What? What are you doing? Like uh, immediately after Aquaman? Like what did that lead to? Finished up the Storm story, and then we started another series, and I simply could not keep up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was I was drained. I was. Uh, I think the overwhelming aspect of what had happened in my career really sank in. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I went and did other things. I uh, got a job with Great Southern Merchandising, uh, designing T-shirts for uh, film and rock and roll. Mm-hmm. And it paid incredibly well. Yeah, you it's know, funny because the, uh, we didn't have like computers the way we have them now. So anything for this t- these T-shirts needed to be hand-drawn. And um, the company was located here in Maca, and it was actually the original merchandising company for Capricorn Music, which mm-hmm. did the Allman Brothers and that whole Maca music scene from that. And growing up here, I kind of had contacts with the Capricorn and the Allman Brothers throughout my life. So it was kind of unnatural that I went to work with them for a while, and it was great. I mean, I had great clients to work with, really added a lot of stuff to my portfolio. Everything from Disney, because I I did the t-shirt artwork for um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah. And we had, like, the non-disclosure, because I saw, you know, scenes and things from the film almost a year before it came out, while it was still in post-production. And um, designed T-shirts for that. Um, it was a blast, and I was getting paid very much more money than I was making in comics. Yeah, I think and, that you know, uh, after a few, after two or three years of doing that, it was like the bug. I miss comics. I'm going to go back to comics. And I, um, about that time, I had the film uh, Lost Boys had come out. And I loved that movie, especially all the references to Peter Pan. And I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to do a graphic novel of James Barry's Peter and Wendy, which has always been one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. Um, I read it when I was incredibly young. And I remember my mom taking me to the movies to see the Disney animated. Yeah. And I mean, I must have been nine or ten. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's like, well, that's your, you know, one of your favorite books. Did you like the movie? And I said, that was nothing like the book. <laughs> Already like a cynic critic at the age of 10. 
As a, a dissing Disney, no less. That's crazy. <laughs> but uh, something about watching Lost Boys, all the Peter Pan references in it, made me start turning over the idea of, you know, illustrating Peter Pan. That would be fun to do. And, of course, you know, um, uh, just kind of the direction I wanted to go in. Like, superheroes were never really my bag unless mm -hmm. they were alternative in some way. Right. Um, and even, you know, Aquaman just, you know, that's you know, the most superhero y superhero out there. But when I had my chance to illustrate it, I took it in a fantasy direction, you know, which is what they wanted. And, you know, the Spectre, that supernatural Starman, you know, it's a superhero, but it's got that incredible James Robinson twist on it. Um, so I was able to do, uh, period comics, which I love, you know, uh, the, in the Starman series, I did, uh, a story set in the seventies in a disco, uh, a, a story in the turn of the century. And I don't think steampunk was even a thing when I did that. And it was this Jules Vernian spaceship being built in the 1800s, um, so, you know, not doing superheroes, but still telling engaging stories. Um, and it's funny because there is a common thread with all this. I seem to be obsessed with uh, doing comic book stories about characters sitting in a bar talking. <laughs> it's happened a lot. So Interesting. <laughs> I've, I've drawn a lot of disco balls. <laughs> it was it was meant to be, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'm wow. still James Robinson is the same. I'm still shocked that that uh, times passed in the '70s disco. We got away with murder on that. <laughs> I mean, here, yeah, page one, he's doing cocaine. Wow! Wow! Of course, yeah. like there's just this intense. Uh, homoerotic aspect to everything. You know, it's funny. Yeah, uh, it was very intentional. I mean, we were doing, you know, and, you know, I think that's when you're an artist, you create your best work when you're outside of any kind of safety zone and you're pushing the envelope and you're trying things that haven't been done before. And I don't think I've ever seen like a superhero comic that has pretty much half of it just two figures talking yeah yeah it was such a, it was a great book and but you bring up a good point someone um i saw someone ask recently uh the question why uh starman wasn't a vertigo book because it wasn't but it very much felt like a vertigo book do you have any inside knowledge on that or no. Well, uh, just uh, the history of the character is so entwined into the DC universe. Yeah. Whereas Vertigo was trying to, was more along the lines of creating its own universe. Oh, yeah. That was you the know? general consensus. So that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, it definitely could yeah, have been a Vertigo. There's so much book. of the classic DCU superhero history behind Starman. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, so it it worked. It worked. Um, so how many issues? It stays um, in reprint. Yeah. I, you know, and it's funny because I am kind of spoiled. So many of these books that I've worked on stay in constant reprint, Starman and Fables. And then that Aquaman series just sits there. <laughs> that is like your uh, your albatross, I guess. I know. Yeah. I know. I don't but know I why. I think there would have to be, uh, you know, we had a very experimental coloring process that DC was using on that book. Well, on all their books at that time. And it's like a flexographic thing. Right. And yeah. so I think to reprint that effectively, they would be looking at an overhead cost of having all that color remastered. Yeah. Well, damn um, it. It's worth it. I mean, that is some really yeah. beautiful art. And I mean, I, I, would be will I would be willing to buff it out, and, you know, re-ink a few panels. And I would love somebody like uh, Jose Villarubia to recolor it. You know, oh, that would be just, gorgeous. Could you imagine? I feel oh like, I my mean, God, yeah. And he's just astounding, you know, yes. his, his yeah. whole approach to color and his color theory and his, and his knowledge. 
of it. Um, I haven't gotten my copy yet, but I definitely want to get this remastered uh, Dan. Uh, oh, yeah. Corbin. Yeah, the previews uh, that he's been posting look amazing. I um, was fortunate en enough to uh, be able to talk to him for my channel, too. And um, it's almost out now, but um, he had given me the inside knowledge that he colored the uh, the Dracula graphic novel that was written by Matt Wagner and illustrated by Kelly Jones that they just did for Kickstarter. So oh, I cannot, yeah. wait. The, the yeah, new I cannot wait for that. Yeah, that's yeah, going to be gorgeous. Gonna be interesting. Gosh, uh, well, I hope the right people are listening to this because uh, to have um, Aquaman uh, miniseries come out and a new trade paperback colored by Jose Villarubia would be like... That's my like, fantasy. That's my yeah. fantasy. Well, you know, I believe in intention, so you got to put it out there. And um, oh, yeah. you're so worth it. You know what I mean? I feel like it's historically relevant. It's your first work. Um, you do have a history of DC and um, with DC and uh, Marie Javins, get off your butt and print it. Okay. <laughs> so um, how many actually uh, do you, are, are there quite a few issues of Starman that you did or? Um, yeah, there's, uh, I think issue 54 of Starman, which is the Victorian Jules Vernian steampunk thing is one of the finest pieces I've ever worked on. And that was just Archie Goodwin being Archie. He said, hey, Craig, take your time with this. There's no deadline. Knock it out of the park. And I was able to work with Ray Snyder, who lives here in Macon. So, you know, our production, it's not like I'm mailing pages off to an inker 100 miles, 1,000 miles away. He's right here in town. We could, you know, we had shared studio space it it was it was a great experience and uh even you know he let me do my own lettering because i i definitely hate production line where you're doing this art and then somebody else is coming in with letterers and they're putting balloons where it did not want them to be and yeah. it's just and it's part of the the whole philosophy and approach that Pete craig russell uses those word balloons are important visual dynamics to guide your eye through a page. They need to be there pretty much before the pictures. Mm -hmm. So you know how much room you have. And, you know, you, you certainly don't enjoy the experience of penciling this entire background that ends up getting covered up. Yeah, or, for sure. You know, by a word balloon. So I was able to uh, do all the lettering on that issue and kind of give it a little touch of Windsor McKay, you know, to help sell that Victorian atmosphere. And um, I was able to enact a lot of the ideas I had when I was working on Peter Pan with changing, with going through uh, visual ornamentation, sort of rethinking the idea of a comic book panel. Uh, you know, for instance, in Peter Pan, uh, the the opening scenes are all Victorian, so I'm doing these very Victorian panel border frames that look like Victorian picture frames and that sort of thing. And then when we introduce the pirates, it I switch to Baroque, these gaudy Baroque frames for, for each panel border. Um, and then when we introduce the Lost Boys in Neverland, everything switches to an Art Nouveau thing. All, you know, turn of the century art references. Um, I was able to do that on a bit of a smaller scale, you know, with the issue 54 of Starman. Um, with, you know, it was a bit more restrained, but I, I still feel like it was very effective. And, um, you know, when you get a script as an artist, you want to figure out how to tell that story most effectively and um, and then find visual things that you can layer into it. And there was one scene in particular where James had mentioned there was they were in the solarium, a greenhouse room, and there was a cockatiel in a cage. 
And I thought, well, this, oh, and there was a, I don't know, I had it in the cockatiel. There was a scene set at a, a rooster fight, a cock fight, gambling den. And there was an owl. And so I'm seeing all these birds casually mentioned. So I'm just like, I'm going to do a bird in every scene. And birds are like incredibly innocuous because they're everywhere. They're, you know, they're omnipresent. Right. So you don't really notice them. But in the story, each scene had its own particular bird that That's would funny. sometimes come into the main action and sometimes just be there to set the tone. Um, but I really loved that when Scout Hunter finally corners the assassin, this owl that we've been seeing sees a rat. And while they fight, the owl is stalking the rat. And of course, when Scout Hunter kills the assassin, the owl kills the rat. So what was the working relationship like with James Robinson? Is he sending you full scripts and you're just drawing them and sending them back? Or are you guys talking at all or working? Well, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't really talk that much, you know. Um, and that that's something kind of frustrating, um, you know, that sometimes you're not communicating that much. But... James was like, just have fun, have a blast. We'd already done the 70s issue together, and that turned out great. So he was like, go haul hog. Yeah. So I did. Yeah, well, that's good. I know on one hand, it's like a, like a gift. On the other hand, it can be a little intimidating, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So, um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, because it's funny, because you talk about uh, your... Uh, mentor earlier saying that you know uh you, comics are beneath you and i would argue that you know comics aren't beneath you but they'll never pay you what you're worth so that's why you know explains why you're going off to have find other jobs like doing t-shirts um that makes right. a, lar a large you know a considerable um, more amount of money you know a lot of artists um, disappear to go to Hollywood and do storyboards. Yeah, where are kind of sacrificing a certain degree of artistic fulfillment. Like I said, well, after two or three years doing the t-shirts and uh, <clears throat> getting paid well, uh, I've been working on the Bon Jovi tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was at my end, at the coming to the end of my time working with them. And boy, Bon Jovi paid great. <laughs> But I was drawing the most ridiculous stuff. Talk about like working beneath my talent. <laughs> and, I was... um, you know, when I miss and I miss comics, I want to go back to comics. So uh, the Peter Pan project started happening because Andy Mangles had already worked up a, a script for an adaptation. So uh, I came on board as the artist and went to town with that. And, but that was involved between, uh, we started out with uh, Cat Ironwood, what was like Eclipse. And I loved the Eclipse books when I was younger. That was inspiration for me. Uh, superheroes with a twist or no superheroes at all. And um, that during the process of that, they sold the project in progress to tundra and then of course by the mid 90s tundra comics in general and tundra especially imploded and you know five years of work just kind of got shelved and, and it has, like it has yet to see the light of day like it's unfinished is that correct yeah i don't think i'll ever complete it but i am uh, making plans to publish like so we work. so we can see what was the work that is done. How much yes. work did you put into yes. it? it? I mean, it is five years worth of work. So it's a, it's a considerable it's, it's, amount. You know, it's well known, but you know, why can't I publish my art and well, of course. You know, make a little bit of money off of it? Finally, well, and and the, and it needs to be seen. I mean. Uh, you know, well, and plus you know, is... I'm, I'm still trying to determine what the best course of, uh, uh, you know, the context, whether I just publish it as the art and leave it at that or 
kind of go into what happened with attempting to create this thing because it was awful. It took me almost uh, after Tundra imploded, they locked it in the safe, and it took it was almost ten years later that I got the original artwork back. Wow! And you know, there's uh, a callous cruelty to this business that continually turns me off to it. Um, and that was one of the most heartbreaking experiences I've had in my life as an artist and creator was when that book just fell apart. Yeah. Um, so laid low for a while, explored other things. And then after a while, I miss comics. I'm going to go see, this is all leading up to something because, uh, I miss comics and start knocking on doors and calling, trying to get back in. And that's uh, when the specter happened. And that was a good way to just get back in there. And I guess this was around 2000, year 2000. And uh, started working for DC again, you know. I, I can do an issue every five months. Yeah. And it will be there and it will be good. I'll be happy with it. And, you know, can we work with that schedule? And I found editors that could. And um, like I said, that got Shelly Bond's attention over at Vertigo. And so I got involved with working on Fables. And I have old friendship with Bill Willingham and, you know, Shelly Bond. So it was, you know, fun. It was, boy, you know, um, I think the first issue had had just hit the stands when I came into ink uh, issue five. And so they sent me the, the ash cans of the first four issues and I'm reading it just delighted. I mean, it, it's cracking me up, you know, in those early issues, it may have been issue two where, you know, it's Manhattan. These three women are getting together for lunch and through the conversation, you realize that Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, and Cinderella, they're bitching about their ex-husband, and you find out it's all one guy, and that's Prince Charming. I mean, <laughs> that to me was just, I'm sold. This is going to be the funniest, most fun book to work on. Yeah, I and, was a fan right away, so for sure. Yeah. And... uh you know, and did that, but, you know, by the end of that run, I was just miserable. You know, I, I was at a point where my page rate on Fables, because, you know, they were defunding Vertigo left and right. Page rates were going, that they were paying, were going down. You pretty much just had the satisfaction of doing good work that you believed in. And um, I was miserable toward the end when I finished up the last uh work that I did on Fables was the Werewolves of the Heartland graphic novel. And uh, I was working with another artist who I did not enjoy working with at all. And it was I was just miserable. And I was like, this is it. Because all throughout my life, I would, you know, I had this deep love of comics. I would work on a project. I'd get my heart broken, go do something else. And then after, oh, I miss comics. I'm going to go back to comics. It's an abusive relationship, Craig. I it had is. that like epiphany, you know, when I finished <laughs> up on Fables. And I'm like, you've just got to break this cycle, you know. I, I didn't know what I was going to do next, but I knew it wasn't going to be that. That was just, it was too much. It was too much. And, you know, I definitely have a sense of self-worth and feel like, I have more to contribute as an artist to the world than staying miserable in comics. You know, that's uh, kind of sad to me because, you know, especially an artist of your caliber um, and, you know, uh, <clears throat> it resonates. Like I think a lot, a lot of people do, you know, I see the people who uh, have careers outside of comics and they do always come back because the love of comics does draw you back in. But I guess you have to resolve yourself to the fact that, if you're going to make comics, it's weird. Everyone always wants to be Marvel or DC and you're Marvel or DC, but you're doing it just because you love comics. Cause obviously um, you're not, you know, able to survive or pay the bills off of it. You know what I mean? So that is kind of heartbreaking. It's like you get, yeah. 
no love from something that you put well, so much love into. Well, and we are we are talking within the framework of the corporate entities of Marvel and DC. Right. You know, there was a big time in there for years where doing commissions was my bread and butter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a great run for uh, a little over a year doing artwork for uh, DC's licensing department for game cards and trading cards, uh, upper deck. And I was very fulfilled with that. It paid great. There's no royalty on it, but boy, they pay you great to do the job. And then I had extra income selling the original art. So that was a good two year run doing that. And then going into commissions um, and doing commissions is incredibly rewarding because that's where you're going to feel the love in comics. It's from the fans and the collectors and, you know, so, and I'm, I'm back into doing that a good bit. Of course, I take, uh, do commissions uh, in the superhero stuff through 4C Comics. Um, I get commissioned to do paintings pretty frequently. Um, I'm teaching, which is just a joy. I know how important it was for me to have Hauser when I was young. And I get to be that for young artists now. And... Um, you know, for a while, I couldn't really teach with a clear conscience because I couldn't encourage anyone to go into comics. And of course, these, these are the kind of students that I attract because of my career that I've had. And now I'm good with it because the comics world has changed so much and self-publishing and that is your alternative now. And it's really the mainstay. And um, I'm all about supporting, you know, young publishers. And uh, right now I'm doing a cover for uh, uh, the Menagerie of the Macabre. And Uh it ties together three books that have been published over the past couple of years. Uh, Signal 29 which is uh, New Orleans cops who encounter a zombie epidemic that's breaking loose in New Orleans. And then their next title was uh, Loop Guru. I did a a variant cover for that, New Orleans werewolf mythology. And then uh, The Dirt Witch, again, Mm -hmm. set in New Orleans. So now they're... um, compiling all those three books into a big collection with new material and uh, tying them all together through this character uh, who uh, uh, Mama May is her name, and she's a voodoo queen. She has a voodoo shop in downtown New Orleans. So you know I'm having fun drawing her. I was going to say that sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. You know, and you know, and I, I can't. You know, years ago, the, there was a when DC did the House of Mystery, brought it back, and with Madame Xanadu, mm-hmm. that first cover by Mike Kaluta, where she's in her parlor and she has the card up. Ooh, mm-hmm. that piece still gives me goosebumps to this day. Yeah. And so <laughs> with Mama May, I can do my, you know, my voluptuous black woman version. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, the the nature of the industry is very different. And, um, you know, if, if you were doing that today, you could easily do your Peter Pan as a Kickstarter. And I feel like that actually is a viable option for it now to do a collection of the finally published, the unpublished work. And you could do annotations and just, you know, you know like been hanging in the air. And there have been several people that I've talked to about it. Um It's been hanging in the year for a while. I think I had to be emotionally ready to go there. Yeah, that's true. Like I said, that was definitely one of the most heartbreaking experiences I've had in my career. Mm -hmm. It seems like it would be a good catharsis for it to see the light of day. I I think I'm finally healed enough to do that. So, yeah, yeah, don't, you know, I I don't want to say too much about it, but it is in the works. Okay, well, I won't press you on it, but I'm, that is good to know. But, you know, it does bring up the good point of how, how, how personal art is and how meaningful it is to us and how much it, it really does 
mean to us, but you know, everything ebbs and flows. And I feel like you have such a long history with Peter Pan and the impact it had on you as a child. That is hilarious that you are probably the only little boy who saw Peter mm-hmm. uh, Disney's Peter Pan and were completely disappointed. I absolutely love that. So I feel like it's going to happen at some point or the other. I just, I've lived long enough to see fate and karma come around. And I think it's happening for sure. Um, so I know you post like a lot of your commissions, like the, the Wolverine commission comes to mind. That was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, That was a year ago. Your color. It wasn't a commission. It was just something I thought I could, I want to, you know, Wolverine's just not a kind of character that I would want to draw. Uh, but he is a popular character. Lots of people love him. And I remember I had to think back to when I really fell in love with Wolverine. It was as a kid reading that issue of, you know, we're in the middle of the Dark Phoenix thing. And they basically just toss him off into the sewer, which was their bad. They're going to regret that. And you yeah, just yeah, sure. and, and, and that last pay panel with John Byrne uh, art. And I'm like, I'm going to do my version of that and see how that goes. I love it because it's it's funny because I, I I I feel about like recreations and homages like if you're gonna do them just do them really good or do them just different enough to make it worth doing and the insane amount of work you put into that definitely made it worth doing for sure. Um, or so even though superheroes aren't like your main thing, I would imagine that's your main if not only request for commissions. Um, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm always pleased, like, no matter what it is, the fact that somebody likes my art enough to get their favorite character, you know, even if it's Razorback. I did. I uh, was, that's what I was thinking. Razorback. I, I, that's the best picture of Razorback. Razorback is beneath your artistic ability. And that I is had fun with it, though. <laughs> the well, most and amazing. I also realized, you know, yeah. As an artist, you can elevate whatever you want to approach. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, playing off the nostalgia, uh, a few months ago, I re-approached the, a Doctor Strange pinup that I had done for Marvel Fanfare. And um, it's kind of a legendary piece now. And I had seen that the black and white original art from back then went to up for auction at Heritage. And um, that was $10,000 somebody spent on my art. Isn't that, and, that's know, so crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And you could, and you could so never I charge thought, that well, for a commission. Know, there's more where that came from. So I redid it a little bit larger, full color. Um, and you know that that's definitely superheroes, but I'm showing them in a non superhero moment. Mm-hmm. You know, and especially back when I first did it, not too many artists did that. You know, yeah. it's just Doctor Strange and Clea hanging out at home on a rainy night. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture, and your recreation is uh, done in Prisma colors. Am I right? And you yes. have this insane like talent for colored pencils, like. W- 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 what is your love of colored pencils? Like, how did that come about? Because I noticed a lot of um, um, your trading cards were done in uh, Prismacolor as well. And they look like oil paintings. They're stunning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, and I, I got no shame in calling them paintings, even though they're not painted. Um, well, they are. I mean, they are. Yeah, even uh, Bill Sienkiewicz refers to them as paintings. Well, uh, that's all you need. This was years ago. I think it was at Big Wow Convention, the convention they used to have in San Jose. And uh, it's definitely, it's like Heroes Con. It's one of those conventions that's very focused on artists and artwork. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe Jusco was there and Michael Golden was there. And I had just finished that big commission of the uh what i called uh, cosmic odyssey and it was mm-hmm. the 70s jim starlin marvel storyline characters 
And so I was delivering that to the client at the show. So I had it framed and we had it on display. And I caught Joe and Michael both like over there just staring at it going, that's colored pencil. How did you do that? <laughs> so and that even itself is a great compliment. I was going to say you're even baffling the masters. So what what chance does a common Joe like me have? <laughs> um, but they really are beautiful. Um, well, and I mean it's a simple technique. It requires a lot of patience, um, you know, because you're basically getting those vivid colors. You build them up slowly in layers, mm -hmm. and uh, like rainy night in the sanctorum, the redux of that. Um, I actually kept track of my hours spent working on it, and it totaled up to 140 hours. I was going to say that must be a heartbreaking uh, <laughs> proposition. I spent 140 hours drawing a trading card. <laughs> well, no, the the, um, the rainy night in the sanctorum is just uh, a piece that I did uh, to sell to put it on the market, and. Um, it's going to be going up for auction at Heritage later in the fall. That's good. And, and you will get the money from it. Yes. This that time, thing Daddy God. gets paid. Yeah, good. This time, Daddy gets paid. And awesome. I'm so happy about that. And I the love people it. at Heritage have just been wonderful to deal with. Um, you know, it's the, the first time that I've sold something through Heritage, even though my artwork has passed through their gavel a lot mm -hmm. over the years. And um, yeah, they've just been fantastic to deal with. But that's so good to hear. Be, uh, selling more pieces with them in the future. It was uh, a real like uh, joy to see you post process shots. Um, you know, as an artist and someone obsessed with art and a big fan of your art, I love that you shared the the you know the little uh, process and the um, final picture of that. Do you have any more? Um, coming up or on deck or ideas or, I mean, you know, I think that you could uh, fetch a pretty penny for a, a, moha a nice Mohawk storm piece. As a matter of fact, there is for the issue of Marvel fanfare that that storm story appeared in. I did the back cover. I can see it in my brain. Yes, it's beautiful. I just shared that with someone recently who loved it. So you, I'm thinking about giving that the prism color treatment. I say the yay, please do that a hundred percent. I mean, I that, can't that, afford that, it. That's, but. That suggestion <laughs> actually came from Allison Song. Oh, really? I have oh, yeah. uh, uh, uh wife and quite a, an amazing artist herself. The queen and just of sheep a lovely dogs. person. She and I have always gotten along like two peas in a pod. Yeah, she seems um, super adorable. I've uh, only only met her briefly buying um, head of sketchbook at conventions. So, yeah, I was uh, going to mention I've had the wonderful opportunity just to hang out with her and have a cocktail or two and laugh. And because they live in Georgia, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for, you know, uh, the guy Jean Studio, Brian him, Brian Stelfreeze, Joe Phillips, who's my brother from another mother. Joe yeah. Phillips is absolutely one of my dearest friends on the planet. And, uh, okay. You know, so I was never a part of Gaijin, but I was always around. Yeah. You know, our, our got late. his eye on you boys. Yeah. I've I, 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 intervened a few times. Yeah. A rowdy bunch. Eh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and I love all their art. Like uh, Jason Pearson is absolutely one of my favorite artists. Um, uh, Brian Stelfreeze, uh, Joe Phillips, of course. Yeah, so many talented artists come from that bunch. Yeah, and, and I really love that because, you know, when Guy Sheen came together, I felt like that there was a Southern voice in mm -hmm. the comics now. Um, that was one of the big changes that we saw in the 80s, uh, you know, with the advent of fax machines and FedEx. You didn't have to live in Manhattan or Brooklyn to work in comics anymore. So if you notice in the eighties, there are all these more diverse voices and styles of art. You know, I had my chance to 
it was just unique, you know, every, and um, you remember Amazing Man, totally oh, yeah. different mm -hmm. style of art, you know, and my God, the obvious Frank Miller. Yeah, you know, totally venturing out. Uh, Bill Sienkiewicz breaking the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just in my mind, that's what you did if you got in comics. You didn't want to draw a comic that looked like everything else. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and the 90s were kind of depressing for me because here I was working on Peter Pan for the first part of the 90s and really striving to put something new and different and unique out there and the all the superhero books looked the same to me it was all the same kind of stylized same kind of crosshatch it was just why is everybody drawing the same the 90s were depressing for everyone when it comes to comics Craig, yeah, just, you, you know, know <laughs> and, and to have you know something that i was working on be defeated and things like that flourishing yeah it was a, kind of a big turn off Do, i don't recall or i don't i don't i'm not aware of any uh digital have you were you ever compelled to try digital art like um oh i suck at it yeah i, I suck at it <laughs> Well, I mean, we can't have, you can't have it all. Like, uh, like right. in a way that kind of makes me feel good because it's like, you're so talented when it comes to, um, you know, uh, traditional art. Like you see someone like Brian Boland who like effortlessly just switched to digital, like quite a pioneer in digital actually. So, um, but digital is hard and, um, you know, uh, it, I don't think you need it. So it's okay. It's okay if you're, if you suck at digital art, I think you make up yeah. for it otherwise. So, I mean, I'm not losing sleep over that. Yeah. I'm so not losing aside, sleep over it. You know, aside, and, um, uh, one of my students, she's, uh, she's definitely a protege student. Uh, I can't help, but get that way. I teach, you know, one-on-one -on -one the same way I was taught. Um, I've learned so much about teaching. When I first went into it, I was just kind of mimicking what Hauser did. But through that process, I see how his teaching approach works. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I say that I've got a couple of 13-year-old boys in my class now. And they both want to do, like, anime, manga style. And I say, and I say the same thing Hauser said. I can't teach you how to do that. I can teach you how to draw them. Oh, I love it. I yeah. love those full circle and, moments. Uh, you know, and uh, Annie, she works digitally as well. She's quite proficient with it, but she also has seen the importance of being able to actually draw. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I've started at Cornerstone, where I teach, is a figure drawing class with live model and everything. Um, I started figure drawing with Hauser when I was 16 and it is the best way to learn how to draw and um, watching Annie, man, she's in her element. It was what she needed. Um, watching her draw every week in figure drawing class, I get goosebumps. It's like watching an old master and she's been on a line decker kick here lately. Wow. And, you know, it's uh, and it shows in her work. And I'm uh, so proud of her. She's uh, taking on illustration jobs. That's her career goal is to be an illustrator. Um, big Star Wars fan, you know, so she would eventually love to get some jobs at Lucas illustrating for them. Um, then I have another student, Solara, who is definitely a storyteller, comic book maker. And yeah. uh, she's uh, she's got this huge graphic novel she's been writing since she was 14 and she's actually a great writer um you know um and so when she started with me i think on her second class i'm like chapter one page one let's get going she's like really <laughs> what <laughs> i'm like yeah that's how it, you got to start somewhere and that's the best place to start um and she's uh almost finished up the first chapter. You know, we broke it into 22 page chapters, which is standard. And, uh, 
she's taken a little bit of break from that. It's gotten a little overwhelming for her. So, but she's still working. What she's going to do is uh, she's come up with a really wonderful idea uh, to do uh, some comics that are just three or four pages, little short stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she's going to have that to play with for a while. And it's a really, really cute idea. It's basically mythical creatures who have to lead a mundane life. Oh, and get jobs I love it. and pay rent. And nobody cares that they're mythical creatures. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That is uh, fun. It's good to know that the uh, next crop of comic book artists is under your wing. It, it's nice to know that there is a next group of comic book artists. I'm glad that people are still excited. Oh, and yeah. Loving and, you know, and, and Solara's, you know, she's free of this, this pressure of having to get a job for DC or Marvel. You know, she's free of, you know, I've just had to readjust my thought process on doing comics and, you know, look around and see how they're done today and realize that it's going to be an ideal situation for her. And, uh, you know, so I've sort of been the straw boss and editor on her book, but boy, talented and self motivated. I love that about her. Yeah, yeah. You have to have uh, you have to have talent and motivation to be an artist. You have to have a lot of things that you obviously have. Um, so aside from the commissions and the teachings and the possible, um, uh, hopefully, something with Peter Pan. Um, Anything else going on that you would like to talk about before we wrap up here? Um, no, that's it. And that's a full schedule for me right there. Yeah, Boy, well, it, sound, it sounds like you're busy and doing good yeah. things. I love that you're teaching. Um, I cannot wait. And now that you know, or now that I know, um, I won't nag you, but I'm desperately going to be keeping an eye out for that storm uh, 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 piece that you'll be working on. And I yeah, hope it's, it's there. And it's also a matter of finding time right now. I have fallen behind the past couple of weeks, two weeks ago. I had, uh, we had an art show here and I had work in it and, uh, Solara and Annie, my students also. So we kind of showed together and that was fun. Um, but I was double booked that night because one of my best friends had her wedding reception. So I started out early in the evening with the art show, then went to the wedding reception and then the dancing started. And then I went back to the art show for the tail end of the evening and they had a DJ and there was more dancing. And the next day, I'm totally forgetting that I'm going to be turning 60 in six months. <laughs> and the next day I realized I had pulled my hamstring. Oh no. I have been in pain ever since. And you just kind of have to take it easy and, yeah, I mean, I'm. We need to wrap up because I've been sitting for an hour, and it's and it's killing you. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's <laughs> disrupted a lot of my desk work this month. Yes, but, I, you know I, what I, can you do if if you can avoid aging? I definitely would recommend it. Like it's it's not for the weak of heart. <laughs> well, and I mean, I was having such a good time dancing at the wedding reception and at the art show and. And it just the next day I was not having a good time and it's been that it takes a well, three or four weeks for a pulled hamstring to really heal up mm -hmm. and so I have to take breaks and go and uh, lay down and raise my leg or go take a hot Epsom salt, salt soap mm -hmm. wow you do what you yeah. got it. the war wounds the war wounds yeah, of if being this, an if, artist uh, uh you know but you know 60 that's a big you know that's a big uh mark to hit in life i think and, uh, it's quite a milestone congratulations yeah you know and, and i'm my best friends are already planning a party in december so oh yeah i'm sure they'll do it up yeah. in a great oh, yeah. grand old fashion for you i think so <laughs> i think so um, you deserve a celebration for sure yeah, I think we'll have a good time. I just got to watch it on the dancing. Yes, for sure. Or just do stretches or something. Just make sure you're prepared. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
all right, well, I will let you go so you can go take care of your hamstring. And I'm so happy that you were able to talk with me today. I'm such a fan of your work. You know how much I love your work and I've admired it from for a long time. I think I was- Well, I have nothing but thanks and gratitude to you, Michael. You know, oh, thank well, you so thank much you. for your, uh, your support and your interest in my art. It means a lot. Yes, I will continue to celebrate you on my channel and let people know what you're up to if anything exciting happens with anything that we've been talking about. And I, I will let you know. All right. Well, thanks so much, Craig. Um, it was great to talk to you. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, make sure you keep an eye out for all of Craig's work and demand that Aquaman Limited series be published by DC Comics. Damn it. It yeah. is long overdue. So thanks for watching, everybody. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and I will bring you more later.